as I came to the end of yesterday, I found myself quite overwhelmed by the power of the day. The welcome to country, which was quite extensive, drew me into the long history of the Gadigal people of their Aura nation who walked this land and on whose land I live at present, and I acknowledge them. Evelyn, in her keynote address and workshop, likewise reminded me of the thousands of years that linked her people and that link her people with Stradbroke Island, which in its turn was a reminder that my own family's love for Stradbroke and the way it is woven into our family story and our memories is so new. As, as I thought of that alongside of her story. The experiential simulation of a session of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was the beginning of an incredible encounter or an encounter with incredible forgiveness that characterized Jin's experience. And in the afternoon session, she took us deeper into her journey I found myself asking, how is such forgiveness possible? And at the heart of Frank's talk, I heard the call not simply to justice, but to mercy. I was overwhelmed when I returned home yesterday by the poignancy of the day, one heart and many voices. As I pondered this experience of yesterday, I found that it was echoed in the paragraph at the beginning of Gaudium et Spes, which I had intended to use to begin my, my paper when I was preparing the paper. And so it was interesting in the light of yesterday to return to it. And it's a text with which we're familiar, and it's a text that I found myself going to because it speaks so much of mission. And this is the text. The joys and the hopes, the grief and anxiety of the people of our time, especially those who are poor or afflicted, are the joys and the hopes, the grief and the anguish of the followers of Christ. Nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts. For theirs is a community united in Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit in their pilgrimage. They cherish a feeling of deep solidarity with the human race and its history. I found it interesting though, as I went back and engaged with that text and that when I was engaging with it in preparation for the talk, I realised that, in fact, it is completely human-centred. Just listen to some of the phrases, the people of our time, nothing genuinely human, a community of people, and deep solidarity with the human race and its history. In drawing attention to this human-centeredness, I don't want to lose anything of the passion and the pathos that calls us to, as Gaudi Metzbez says, deep solidarity with the human race and its history. Indeed, the cries of those who suffer profoundly in our world today reach us with more urgency, it seems, than ever before. But, there is another voice that we're beginning to hear, and it's the voice of Earth. And just as Gaudium et Spes touched and continues to touch hearts attentive to the cries rising up from humanity and the human community that suffers, so too does a new document, Laudato Si, Care for Our Common Home, touch our hearts anew calling us to an attentiveness to earth. Evelyn drew us into the intricate interweaving of this twofold story as she engaged us yesterday. 
Pope Francis in Laudato Si speaks out a challenge, a newly emerging challenge for our time when he says in Article 2 of his encyclical letter, published in Rome on the 18th of June 2015, and he says, Earth now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed earth. And then he goes on to say, we have come to see ourselves as earth's lords and masters entitled to plunder at will. The violence present in our hearts wounded by sin is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. This is why the earth, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and the maltreated of the poor. It might be well to us hear that last phrase. This is why the earth, burdened and laid waste, is amongst the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. It's no longer sufficient then for those called to mission to hear the cry of the human poor alone. It has become a gospel imperative to hear the cry of the earth also. This is a call to mission in a new key. It is inviting us to engage with our biblical and our theological traditions that impel and inspire our engagement in mission in new ways, so that they speak not only in a human key, but in a more than human register. In this paper, I propose to undertake such a re-engagement with a gospel, and in this instance, the gospel of Matthew, reading just a few selected texts but reading them anew in light of the ecological consciousness that is growing and developing among us as church, as one's mission to bring the good news alive in our world. And so the first section that I want to take up is a call to a new conversion. And I'll articulate that in a sense, in my words, a call to a new conversion, and then we'll engage that call in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 3 opens into the adult ministry of Jesus with the time and the place reference. And this is how it opens. In those days, John the Baptist came into the wilderness of Judea. One of the things that I discovered, which I think was quite extraordinary in doing the research from my book, is that there is no gospel story, no human story, no earth story with a, without a grounding in time and place. I think we've tended to treat them in the gospel as sort of just the next step, like that'll get us now to the, to the real story and then we, we get into the real story. What I want to suggest is that if we're going to learn to read the gospel text anew and to allow it to shape a new consciousness for us, we have to be attentive to that time and place. It's not just there to get us to the next point, but it's there to shape us in the way of gospel. And so it's from such a context that the words of John the, the Baptist, the preaching, as it is called, rise up. And this is, this is the preaching of John. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Repent for, and I'll use this word over and over because I can't find a right translation for it, but the text says, repent for the basileia, which is the word for empire or kingdom, as we often translate it. The basileia of the heavens is near at hand. 
But we, before we turn too quickly from the earthing of the text, let me just go back. Notice how it starts. In those days, John the Baptist came into the wilderness of Judea. And in a sense, it, it draws us as readers, particularly as ecological readers, it draws us into the materiality, the groundedness of the story. It's, it's in the wilderness. And there's a number of layers I'm going to share with you about how we can hear that word and how we can begin to shift our consciousness in relation to it. So wilderness functions in a number of ways in the narrative. First of all, in its very materiality, it is the, one of the things that I think I've learned about trying to read the text anew is that the, the materiality, in fact, draws us into the text and it grounds us in that very materiality, in the, earth, the earthness itself. Then there's a first layer, in a sense, of wilderness, and that is the area, as, as it's encoded in the text, the area extending west of the Lower Jordan and Dead Sea into the central plateau or hill country of Judea. So that's evoked at the level of the narrative. It draws us into that. At a second level, wilderness functions metaphorically in the text, and we actually, I think, probably tend to go to that stage in our reading of it. And that, that's the remembrance of Israel's desert wanderings and the rendering of wilderness or desert as a place of divine encounter. And I suspect when most of us read that text, that's where we go most particularly. And so we're very familiar with that. At a third level, though, the, the wilderness is John the Baptist's lived space where his preaching is grounded. So it's where John is and it's where we're drawn into, in a sense, as ecological readers of the text. As contemporary Australian readers or listeners, we recognise that wilderness has been the lived space for Indigenous people in Australia for millennia, and we heard that yesterday and some again today. Colonisation has changed that, however, so that Davy, Davy Pulkara, an Indigenous elder, can say of the present, wild people, referring to colonisers, make wild country, degrading or failing country. Lived space is under threat when we hear that echo in the text. Indeed, earth is crying out, as Pope Francis says, and we are hearing this cry quite loudly in Australia at present in many ways, including through the voice of our Indigenous Australians, such as Daly Pulkara. It is from such a contemporary wilderness that new preaching can emerge. But we have to be attentive to that new wilderness. Another cry from the wilderness, the created wildernesses that we are hearing at present across Australia, is that of the earth that's being mined, that's being fracked. We can almost feel the violence of this in our bodies. And at present, it is being refracted, I think, for us through the Adani mine in central Queensland. And I think that the, each of those are elements that, in a sense, are speaking from the text and taking us into the text. This Adani mine and others like, like it across the current Australian landscape constitute the constructed wilderness that can no longer be lived space, but which is crying out to us metaphorically and materially, repent. Wilderness therefore functions at multiple layers in the reading of or engagement with the Mathean text, particularly when we attend not only or solely to the human encoded in the text, but also the material or earth 
and all its contents. So I'm inviting us to listen to the multiple layers of wilderness or earth as we tr seek to read this text ecologically. Returning to the Mathean text, we as readers have learned that John is preaching in the wilderness and we are made privy to his words, repent for the basileia of the heavens or the sky is near at hand. John calls his listeners to repent. Is this, we might ask, a first step to mission, especially a mission that is new, like the ecological mission? Metanoeo is the Greek verb meaning to change, especially to change one's mind or one's noose using the Greek word, to change one's thinking. We have tended to think that metanoia or metanoia is about action, and it is that, but it is first and foremost about our noose, about our minds. Pope Francis, like John the Baptist, is calling us in Laudato Si to, and I quote, a profound interior conversion. And so that profound interior conversion is in a sense a forerunner for the conversion that will find expression in our lived reality in our world. As Matthew 3, 2 unfolds, it is as if John is answering his own question of why repent? Why change one's way of thinking one's way of being in the world. The response comes from the gospel, and it is this. We are to change because the basileia, the empire, the kingdom of the heavens or of the skies is near at hand or has come near. This is a, not an easy concept, this notion of the basileia or the kingdom or the empire of the skies. It's a, it's a difficult one, but I want to explore it a little bit with you. And as I'm doing, exploring it from an ecological perspective, it's offering a new vision. It was the proclamation of Jesus to offer a new vision to the people among whom he preached. It was the, it, the task, in a sense, of the Mathean community to offer that similar challenge to the probably quite small community somewhere in Galilee that was he hearing the gospel of Matthew. And yet it's an extraordinary call that is coming to, to these, these small groups of people. So what might that call to repent because there's a new basileia of the heavens or the skies. What might that have sounded like and how can a little bit of knowledge of that help us to read and hear the text ecologically today? For the first century Mathean community, the basileia would have evoked the empire of Rome with all its political, economic, social, and cultural powers, oppressive powers. How could such an entity be associated with repentance? And it seems that the preaching of John, uh, the, the incorporation of that into the, into the gospel is offering a subversive or a subversion of that notion of the empire. It's not the empire of Rome, but it's an empire of the heavens or the skies. An extraordinary phrase, actually, as we'll see for an ecological reading. It calls forth a new social imagination, an alternative to the oppression of Rome. And so it's not the basileia of Rome, it's the basileia of the heavens and the sky. This was the Mathean evangelist's challenge to a small Galilean community. Today then, for contemporary readers and listeners like John, the basileia with the phrase of the heavens or the skies associated with it can evoke for us the earth-centeredness to which Laudato Si is calling us. 
the core call of the Matthean Gospel is one to conversion. There's our text, repent, be converted. But it is not only within the human community, but also within the earth community, the universe community, as evoked by the phrase, the heavens and the earth. We're invited to be attentive to our heavens and our earth. They cannot be just metaphors functioning in a human world. So it's not just a metaphor about how we live as human beings, but the heavens, the earth, and all the materiality that constitute them must be befriended, engaged with, cared for, and loved in a new universe that is emerging and to which the gospel is calling us. Just as that call went to the Jesus community and went to the Matthean community. Attentive also to the Basileia of the central Matthean proclamation, we will look to the social and politico-cultural relationships that interweave with the material in this new vision. This is the vision to which the voice of the earth calls us. The centrality, the centrality of this call is made manifest in the Matthean Gospel when in 417, and this, I haven't got this actually on the text itself, but this exact same proclamation is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So in Matthew's Gospel, the proclamation of John the Baptist is this, Repent, for the basileia of the heavens or the skies is near at hand. The key statement of the proclamation of Jesus in chapter 4, 17 is exactly the same. Repent, for the basileia of the heavens or the sky is near at hand. So I hope you can hear, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that a lot of this material may be new and it's asking, it's asking of a new approach, but... I think the, this double repetition, in a sense, as a, is a commissioning to us to try to hear anew, to hear this gospel story anew. This was the task that John the Baptist took up, that Jesus took up, to, to proclaim something new, something that would break the mindset. The people knew Rome, they knew the oppression of Rome. So what did it mean to talk about a basileia of the heavens or the sky? What was that breaking open? And then for us today, what I'm suggesting that we're being invited into is how that same gospel text can break open a mindset for us, can break open the androcentrism, which keeps us grounded in a sense in the human empire, and it invites us to break that open with the, the Basileia, the new vision for the, for the heavens themselves, for the Iranoi. That's the invitation that I think, and that's the, that's the new way of reading the text that I'm trying to suggest. So in continuity with the Christian tradition that has its roots in the gospel, Laudato Si also calls for conversion, just as the Gospel of Matthew does. But now, in a new time, in a new place with new challenges, different to those in the time and place of the Roman Empire. We're not in Rome. We're not in Palestine under Roman domination. So the call is new. It is named ecological conversion by Pope Francis. It too is a call to a changing of our mind or a changing of our noose. What we have in our minds in relation to ecology, the logos of the ecosystem. In the words of Laudato Si, the ecological crisis is a summons to profound interior conversion. The paragraph concludes with the challenge that living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue. It is not an option or a secondary aspect of our Christian experience. 
It is indeed mission. And that's what I'm suggesting we're being invited to today. In a more recent document, namely the message, and this has got a long title, the message of His Holiness Pope Francis for the celebration of the World Day of Prayer for the Care of Creation that was promulgated on the 1st of September 2016 and named in a simpler way, Show Mercy to Our Common Home, Pope Francis takes up the paradigm of repentance, the core Mathean invitation. Before he places the challenge to repentance before his readers, the Pope lays out human ecological, what he calls human ecological sin. And this is what he says that sin is, the sin that requires repentance. Remember the Mathean uh, call in the, in the back of our minds. It is to destroy the biological diversity of God's creation to degrade the integrity of the earth by causing changes in its climate, by stripping the earth of its natural forests or destroying its wetlands, to contaminate the earth's waters, its land, its air and its life. These are sins. What a simple and what a direct prophetic challenge like that of John the Baptist and Jesus. Repent change your way of seeing, change your way of being. That's the call from the Pope that echoes the call in Matthew. Beyond the ecological conversion and repentance is what the Pope names as, and I quote, a changing course or new action, a new mission. If we return to the Mathean Gospel, we find, as I mentioned to you before in 417, that in fact, Jesus' call to conversion is the same as, as John's. Repent, for the basileia of the heavens has come near. And it's followed very, very closely by Jesus laying out a new way of acting at the beginning of, his pre of Jesus' preaching in the Gospel of Matthew, and that is the Beatitudes with which you're most familiar. It's interesting, when I was, when I was doing my own ecological reading and developing that, I imagined that it would be very difficult to read the Beatitudes ecologically. They're, they seem to be so much about human and human-centered uh, ethics, and yet I found it extraordinary. I'll only have time today to open up one beatitude, the first one, a little bit with you to an ecological reading, but a, a fuller reading is, is for another time and another place. And so... Let's have a look at the Beatitudes. I'll leave the text up there for you. Before readers hear the teaching of Jesus, they are drawn into what I call the ecological texture of the Mathean text. Initially, if you just have a look at those words up there in front of you as I talk to them. Initially, Jesus sees the crowd and the ecological reader can encounter them in all of their materiality through Jesus' eyes. Likewise, Jesus walks up a mountain or a hill. He treads on the earth. And then he sits down so that his flesh, his garments, touch and intertwine with earth. His body, his open mouth, is the place from which teaching emerges. As I think I probably said earlier, but it's something maybe that needs to be repeated as we learn this new way of reading. There is no gospel without the material. The narrative makes this clear. But can the Beatitudes, which seem to be about virtues, about human virtues, can we read those ecologically? So let's, let's try the first one, which in some ways you'd think is probably the hardest to read ecologically, as it reads, blessed are the poor in spirit. So it already seems to take us away from the material. 
for theirs is, there's our image again of the basileia of the heavens. So the first of Jesus' beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, seem to obscure the material, as I was just saying. Jesus' evocation of the poor in spirit has challenged biblical scholars because the phrase does not occur at all in the Jewish scriptures or indeed in the Greek literature of the time. So where do we go to help us know what this poor in spirit is actually? Scholars have, however, associated it with a virtue that was prized in antiquity, namely humility. Such a virtue links the human with the humus or the earth and hence invites contemporary readers to hear the beatitude in a new key, to hear it calling us to right relationship with all others, not just in the human community, but the more than human community, all that constitutes our universe. This is to be truly humble. And what a challenge this is to the human community that has seen itself and continues to see itself as the center of the universe. In the second half of this opening beatitude, Jesus gives the reasons why the poor in spirit are proclaimed blessed. Theirs is this phrase again, theirs is the basileia of the heavens. And notice how that phrase, the basileia of the heavens, frames the beatitudes. You find it in the first and you find it in the last. And so at the heart of the beatitudes is, or the at the heart of the living of the Beatitudes is the actual bringing about of this basileia of the heavens. And so in the second half of the opening Beatitude, Jesus gives the reason why the poor in spirit are proclaimed blessed. Theirs is the basileia of the heavens. The proclamation of John, the proclamation of Jesus, and now foundational to the Beatitudes. The metaphor of the basileia carries in it, as I've tried to indicate earlier, but want to say in a different way here, the materiality of the heavens. The heavens, the sky, together with their galaxies, stars and heavenly entities that constitute the universe. It's not limited to one place, given the plural, uranoi, but it gives place to Jesus' new social imaginary that he calls the basileia. It's the basileia of the heavens or of the sky. It is in contrast, and this I think is important, it's in contrast to the basileia of Rome in which political and military power over facilitated and constituted their vision of the Pax Romana with little attention given to the relationship between the human and the other than humans within this basileia. And so this brief engagement with the first of the Beatitudes confirms that it is possible to read and to hear them in a new key. I'm going to leave the second, but I'll just talk just in one or two minutes about uh, a second beatitude, which I think is intimately linked into the, the whole of them, the way the first is. And this is the, sorry. This is the, the fourth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, that's an unfortunate word in English because it's got negative connotations. But in the scriptures, righteousness is the right ordering. It's the right ordering of relationships. And we would tend to think about the fourth beatitude, blessed those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, in terms of that right ordering of the human community. But in fact, if we're seeking to hear and read ecologically, it's, it's a much bigger right ordering. It's the, it's the right ordering of all relationships. So the, the human, the other than human, uh, in, in that right relationship. And notice how, in, I don't think this has got a pointer, so I won't try to do it again. 
But notice in the structuring of the Beatitudes how the basilae of the heavens at the end of the first and at the end of the eighth, righteousness is at the end, is, is at the heart of the fourth Beatitude and then it's repeated again uh, for blessed are those persecuted for righteousness sake. So that right ordering, the, the right ordering not only in the human community as we've tended to think about it, but the right ordering in the earth community, in the other than human community, is at the heart of beatitude. So we could do a lot more on any of the other Beatitudes, but I think the very way that the, the poor in spirit, the basileia of the heavens, the righteousness, permeate the Beatitudes, they give us a lot of work to do. That might be a little exercise to take home, to have a look at the Beatitudes tonight and to, to see how would, you, how would you read them in an ecological key. If we were having a workshop after this, we could perhaps do that. I'm just skipping a little bit here. so. And so, let me pick up again. The yearning toward and desire for right ordering characterises many who hear the call to mission in a new key. And just as the Beatitudes needed to find expression in the lives of those who heard them, so too our mission in a new key must be expressed in new actions. Pope Francis recognises this. I'll just move over this. Pope Francis recognises this when he says that the duty to care for creation will find expression even through little daily actions, such as avoiding the use of plastic and paper, reducing water consumption, separating refuse, cooking only what can be reasonably consumed, showing care for other living things planting trees, or any number of other practices. In Show Mercy to Our Common Home, he goes on to say that we must not think that these efforts are too small to promote in our world. Rather, he says, they call forth a goodness which encourages a prophetic and a contemplative lifestyle a lifestyle which we may say in our exploration in this paper is characterised by a living of the Beatitudes. We've been listening to the call to a new conversion refracted through the opening chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. We've heard John the Baptist's and Jesus' foundational message, repent, and Jesus' preaching of the Beatitudes as characteristic of the new Basileia, the new vision that he is proclaiming. Time will not allow us to do, sorry, there are many places along the unfolding of the Matthean Gospels call to mission where we could pause and hear the same foundational calls in different keys. Time won't allow us to do that in this lecture, but in conclusion, I want to turn from the opening of Jesus' preaching with John the Baptist to its closing in Matthew 25, to the last great parable of the sheep and the goats, and within that to verses 35 and 36 and verse 40. It's a text with which you're familiar. I was hungry and you gave me food, thirsty and you gave me something to drink. A stranger, you welcomed me, Naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. In prison and you, invi you visited me. And then the phrase with which we're familiar, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. This is the last great affirmation of, by Jesus of mission in Matthew's gospel in giving food, water, clothing, time and presence, the giver gives to Jesus, is what the Matthean text says. This echoes the opening paragraph of Gaudium et Spes with which we started. Along the way, however, 
we have seen that the gospel story can be heard in another key, not just the human key. It, is had, it has invited, it has called us to a new conversion, to read with new eyes, to hear with new ears, and to attend to the other than human. Not the easiest task to do, I think you might have seen as we've gone along. In relation to the final great parable and its climax, just as you did it to one of the least, you did it to me. Sorry, I'll just must repeat. New eyes let us see that it is human bodies in all their materiality that receive care and attention, and the needs are likewise material for food for clothing, for shelter, for bodily care. They bring the human and the other than human together. There is a reordering, a re-establishing of right relationships, of dikaiosune or righteousness that characterise the Beatitudes and that between and among the human and the other than human. This is the most explicit, the most material of Jesus' affirmation. As you do this reordering of relationships, both material and social, among the least, you are doing it to or in me, are the words of Jesus. This is an ethic that can catch up the human and other than human in a reordering of right relationships righteousness or dikaiosune, which is at the heart of Matthew. If such an ethic, such a right ordering were to be undertaken by today's human communities in their relationship with all the other than human communities around planet Earth, this would truly manifest the basileia of the heavens the heart of the Matthean call to mission. Such sentiments are echoed in Pope Francis' proclamation of a new work of mercy, which is both corporeal and spiritual. And he says, and this is his, his text, uh, A Care for Our Common Home. And he says, it's a work which constitutes mission. As a spiritual work, Pope Francis says that it, and I, and I quote this, what I've done here, it looks like a mess when you look at it, but it's the collection of the spiritual works of mercy. And into that, I've put the, these words of, of Pope Francis. He says of the spiritual works of mercy, they call for a grateful contemplation of God's world which allows us to discover in each thing a teaching which God wishes to hand on to us. And so Pope Francis is adding a new spiritual virtue, and that is the care for our common home. But he's also, in that same document, adding another to the corporal works of mercy. And as a corporal work of mercy, he says... Care for our common home requires simple daily gestures which, which allow, sorry, which simple daily gestures which break with the logic of violence, of exploitation and selfishness. And again, continuing his words, and makes itself felt in every action that seeks to build a better world. The last great parable of the Matthean Gospel has been expanded to include a new work, Care for Our Common Home. The theme of this conference, One Heart, Many Voices, provided an impetus for me to explore with you an urgent voice that is rising up from earth at this time, calling us to repentance. It does not replace the more traditional call to mission as we heard it at the commencement of this lecture in the opening words of Gaudium et Spes. What, is what it does is augment that call 
so that we can hear together the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. In saying that, however, I'm aware of our long history and reflected experience of attending to the cry of the poor. The cry of the earth is much more recent and we are newly learning ways of attending to this cry. It's inviting us, as evidenced in Laudato Si, and show mercy to our common home. It's inviting us, and this is the strong invitation that I would give, it's inviting us to reread our tradition, our biblical, theological, spiritual, and other traditions, to reread them anew. In this way, these traditions will be foundational to our life and mission as they have been in the past, but in a new key. Thank you very much.